Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, September 6th, and we will be hearing the presentation, Public Art and Artist Property Rights. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your webcast toolbar, uh, or you can call uh, the 1-800 number that should be in your webcast toolbar. Um, but if you do have any issues, just go ahead and type those in and I'll see if I can help you. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in that chat box located in the webinar toolbar. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2019. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. In particular, we are thankful for today's sponsor, the Urban Design and Preservation Division, which you'll hear a little bit more from Margaret in just a moment. So thanks to you for joining us uh, and for always producing great content for us here on the Planning Webcast Series. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. We do have a few slots left for 2019, but you guys were starting to book for 2020. I can't believe it. Uh, we have a great lineup here for the rest of the year, so we're closing out strong. And you will notice that we have a couple upcoming webcasts that are uh, at a different time. We are attempting to accommodate specifically those uh, out on the West Coast that are presenting um, and in fact, internationally. So we're uh, trying this out just for a couple of these. So be sure to note if you're joining us for any of these upcoming sessions, uh, beware. So today's webcast is uh, available for 1.5 law CM credits. And you can log those credits by heading over to planning.org logging into your my APA account and then you can either search by the title or the event number do not write this event number down i keep forgetting that i've been adding the event number to my presentation so this is one from last time uh, so the event number and the title can both be found on our webcast webpage ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast if you need it to log those credits like I said, it's good for 1.5 CM credits. For live viewing only, we do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. Again, just head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast for a list of those. And like us on Facebook planning webcast series to receive up-to-date information on our sessions and subscribe to our YouTube channel because guess what? We have over 300 sessions recorded and up on our YouTube channel for you to view. And I think we have over 1,500 or 2,000 subscribers. It's, it's insane. We love it. So please subscribe to our channel so you can get up-to-date information and you can view our sessions. Okay, with that, I am going to turn it over to Margaret Rifkin of the Urban Design and Preservation Division, who is going to kick us off here. Margaret. Hello, everybody. Welcome from the Urban Design and Preservation Division. I'm Margaret Rifkin. I'm the director of our webinar program. And we invite you to become more involved in the division. Uh, for example, you could write for our newsletter. You could work on our webinar program. Or um, I suggest you go to our division's website. We have a whole section with volunteer opportunities identified. We have several positions that we'd love to fill and that you might enjoy being involved in. We also have a tradition of running contests with prizes. So of course you could participate in our next contest. It's our clever way of collecting great ideas to share with everybody. Last year's was in partnership with the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking, and it resulted in our receiving some great short essays and wonderful photographs featuring a variety of projects from all over the world. So if you'd like to see the top submittals, you can find them once again on our division website, which you can locate by simply going to urbandesign.planning.org. 
via the big APA website. Um, now, our next webinar will be in October. It's on Path as Place, the experiential side of transportation. It will be presented by urban designer Cindy Zerger and transportation engineer Ian Lockwood of Tool Design. With that, I will turn the microphone over to Leo Vasquez, the director of the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking. Great, uh, thank you, Margaret, and uh, also thank you, Chris. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be working with both of you on this uh, webinar series. I uh, just want to say a few words about uh, the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking, and uh, also to introduce our uh, presenter for today. Um, the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking builds capacity, connections, capacity, and community through webinars, workshops, and a certificate program and other uh, activities uh, to assist uh, planners, uh, landscape architects, other urban professionals in how to enhance communities uh, through local arts and culture. Uh, now, a creative placemaking is not uh, is not just another word for a city beautiful. It is really a new uh, a type of, of planning practice uh, that can challenge. Uh, the work that planners do. So our our role in the ecosystem is to help uh, those professionals and artists who want to do this work. Uh, you can find more information about us at cpcommunities.org. I do want to just uh, take a, 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 about 30 seconds to talk about some of our upcoming events. So if you can go to the new, next slide. Um, so we have a an information session for our certificate in creative placemaking program, which starts in October. Uh, then we have a webinar, and I'm glad that it doesn't conflict with any of the APA webinars about creative placemaking and how it connects community, cultural, and economic development. Uh, I hope you'll join us in Cincinnati on October 10th to 12th for the Midwest Creative Placemaking Leadership Summit. And uh, just as a gift for everybody who's participating today, you can get a 20% discount, which is which is about $60 off a full summit ticket. Just use the code PARTNER20. Now, if you can't make it to Cincinnati in October, then please join us in November in Phoenix for the National Creative Placemaking Leadership Summit. And you can find out more information and register for any of these sessions and more at cpcommunities.org. Now, I'd like to uh, just introduce, introduce. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback there, uh, introduce our presenter for, for today. Uh, Sarah Conley Odenkirk is uh, uh, just a, a great resource uh, for us as planners. Uh, she's, uh, she's got a distinct set of knowledge and skills. Uh, there are, she's an arts lawyer, uh, a land use lawyer, uh, you know, works on copyright, on intellectual property issues. Now, you can find a lot of lawyers who know about arts but don't know land use. You can find and just the opposite. But it's very rare to find somebody with with her knowledge and skill sets. And the things that we're going that she's going to talk about today are really, I think, going to challenge uh, some of our thinking or challenge us to really look at our ordinances, to really look at at our, our plans, especially those of us who work in redevelopment, who write zoning ordinances. So, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to uh, hearing you. Thank you, Leo. Um, I, oh, thank you very much, Leo. I see that my screen is now the screen that is uh, going to be controlling here. So great. Hopefully everybody can see the slides that I'm going to be talking about. And of course, as a lawyer, I've got to start off with the most boring part of the presentation, and that is a disclaimer. Um, in, in the course of this lecture, uh, you will see many images. These images may or may not be in the public domain. And for those uh, that are not in the public domain, their use applies just um, in terms of their use in this lecture as they're being used for purely educational purposes. Further, this presentation as a whole is copyrighted and may not be used in any context outside of this webinar environment without specific permission. 
Please do not reproduce, share, or otherwise distribute any image or material contained herein. And by adhering to these standards, we can all enjoy learning about the material, which is very interesting, I hope, um, while also respecting the rights of the artists and authors. So thank you very much for your cooperation and participation. And now that I've put you to sleep, let's move on <laughs> to the pages. Now, for some reason, it's not letting me. Try right clicking. If you have a right click option. I do, but it's not advancing. Let's try. Well, we practiced this, folks, but I guess we didn't <laughs> practice advancing the slide. <laughs> Let's see. Um, any suggestions, Christine? Um, and you said the right click, maybe uh, exit the presentation mode and then go back in presentation mode. We'll try that. Okay. Looks like we have to talk about the disclaimer for the okay. whole. There we go, right? Right. The whole time. That'll be great. <laughs> That's what your plan was this whole time, wasn't it? Lots of long minutes for that. Okay. Did that change to the next slide, copyright? It sure did. Excellent. All right. So there's our bump. It'll be perfect from here on out. Back to the Middle Ages. Um, the concept in Western historical terms that an author of creative work should have some specific protections goes back to the 1400s and 1500s when printers were granted special rights and privileges with regard to their publications. However, and thankfully, in the United States, copyright law is derived from the Constitution. Uh, the the, the um, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution is what governs, and um, this states that Congress shall have the right to uh, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So what I'm going to do here is just briefly go through copyright law like at lightning speed, hopefully not too fast for anyone to understand, but I want to lay the groundwork um, with regard to copyright law um, in the short time that we have. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the very, very basic scratching the surface of copyright. Um, I will also speak about um, fair use and then the Visual Artist Rights Act. And these three components are really, I think, the major um, aspects of intellectual property law to understand in order to really get an understanding for uh, the disputes that are popping up around uh, the integration of art in the built environment. So um, that's my plan for, for today. Uh, we'll see how long that goes. I could probably talk for a couple of days, but we've got an hour and a half. So I will um, uh, keep, try to keep an eye on the time here. Maybe Christine can also uh, nudge me if I'm going over an hour, because I do want to leave some time for questions and answers at the end of this. So away we go. Uh, Everything that you've ever wanted to know about copyright that I don't talk about today, you can find at copyright.gov. This is the Library of Congress website that contains an incredible amount of information. It's also where one would go to uh, register copyrights um, and uh, do any research or um, uh, exploration that you might need to do. So what is covered by copyright? And this is definitely a question that comes up in a lot of situations. Um, but the copyright law provides a list of, um, of creative works that are covered by the law. Um, and uh, again, this was codified originally with the notion that artists or authors should benefit from the fruits of their labors for some specified period of time. Um, this list originally was much smaller, but it was augmented over time to account for technological progress, among other things, and eventually expanded to cover a wider range uh, of, of works that you see here. In addition to listing the types of works that are susceptible to copyright protection, the law also establishes another key requirement for copyright protection. And this is something to really pay attention to as well. Of course, everything I'm saying should be paid attention to, but these are the, the sort of the highlights. Um, and that expression is fixed in a tangible medium. Um, so this is part of the language of the copyright law. And uh, what it means is that a copyright in a creative work exists and is owned by the author or the artist 
as soon as the work is fixed in a tangible medium. This phrase um, has had to be flexible, again, with the advancements in technology. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that needs to be, um, a, it needs to accommodate new uh, ways of fixing expression. But bottom line is that basically any creative expression in a physical or technological format that's viewable or usable by others will be considered fixed in a tangible medium. This comes into play in a couple of cases we'll take a look at in a little while. Um, the existence and ownership of the copyright is established here even if the work is not registered with the Library of Congress, although it is important to understand that in order for a copyright owner to be protected by the copyright laws um, and be able to pursue that in court, there needs to be a registration in place. We're not going to go into the steps for registration today, um, but again, that information is certainly available on the copyright.gov website. Okay, so what does owning a copyright actually mean? Copyright gives the owner a group of rights that are often described as a bundle of sticks that can be separately sold, licensed, or transferred. The bundle includes the exclusive right to reproduce the copyrighted work. You'll see my visuals here will hopefully illustrate that. Um, to prepare derivative works, meaning that any work based on the original work um, would be a derivative work. To distribute copies of the work um, and to perform the work. And then finally here, to display the work. So using this concept of a bundle of rights, let's talk for a minute about how this is practically applicable in the art world context. When an artwork is sold, unless there's a specific statement signed by the owner transferring the copyright, that is the only thing that is sold. The physical work is the only thing that's sold. Without a signed transfer, the copyright remains with the uh, owner or artist for the life of that artist plus 70 years. The other way for a copyright to transfer from the artist to another owner is if the work is created as a work made for hire. That is a term of art um, that is again, really important to understand and comes up in a lot of these copyright cases as well. But basically, the, the simple way to understand that is that there's either a contract in place that designates a work as a work made for hire or uh, employees uh, that are operating within the scope of their employment duties will also be considered to have created works for hire. Because of these sometimes complicated and um, uh, questionable situations that arise when uh, the intentions are not specifically articulated, best practices in the public art world, which is really what's going to apply here in these contexts that we're discussing today, require that copyright remain with the artist. Uh, for that reason, contracts should always clarify that copyrights are not included in the purchase of the artworks. And this is frequently the source of much debate, but there are a number of reasons why that is the best practice. Um, if it makes sense and there's interest, we can come back to this at the end of the conversation uh, and circle back and, and talk about what those specific reasons are. But it really is uh, best for all parties to be very clear about what rights are needed and put that uh, in a contractual context. Okay, so that was the lightning speed run through copyright law. Again, just barely scratching the surface. And now we're going to talk a little bit about fair use. So even if the artist maintains the copyright, there are circumstances which allow the use of that work without permission. And those circumstances fall under fair use. This term is something that is often thrown out um, and, and thrown around casually as a defense to infringement. Um, but it is not always effective, um, nor is it always used in the, in the proper sense. So let's take a quick look at fair use so that you can have in mind um, as we go through some of the cases. What, uh, what fair use actually means. So in determining um, whether uh, the use of a work is uh, fair use, there are four factors to be considered. Um, these four factors are number one, the purpose and character of the use. And I'll run through each of these with some illustrations. So hopefully we can be clear on those four uses. Um, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or as a nonprofit educational purpose. 
this comes up often, of course, when people say, but I'm not making any money, I'm just using an image, but that's only one of the factors that needs to be considered. The second is the nature of the copyrighted work. Again, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, number three is the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And we'll see that point come up in a number of the cases at the end as well. And number four, the effect of the use uh, upon the potential markets or the value for the copyrighted work. So um, again, let's start at the beginning uh, with number one. Because the dissemination of facts or information benefits the public, you're going to tend to have more leeway um, to copy from factual works such as biographies than you do from fictional works such as plays or novels. This doesn't necessarily uh, pertain to the mural situations that we're going to talk about today, but again, the nature of the work really is an important uh, piece of the, the overall fair use uh, analysis. In addition, you'll have a stronger case of fair use if you copy the material from a published work as opposed to an unpublished published work. Um, and the scope of fair use is narrower for unpublished works because the author has this underlying right to um, determine the, the, the first public appearance of their work. So um, unpublished work is gonna get just a little bit more protection. All right, number two, amount and substantiality or the heart and soul of the work. Uh, while there's no set percentage or formula to guide you in determining how much of a work it is okay to take, it is certainly true that the less you take, the more likely it is that you can argue fair use for that portion of the work that you do take. However, um, it's really important to be aware of, of uh, the nature of what you're taking, the, the importance of what you're taking, because if you're taking the heart and soul of a work, even uh, a small amount of the work can effectively um, result in an infringement that you will not be able to get out of uh, with a fair use defense. Three is the purpose and character. And this one has come up quite a lot lately in cases. Uh, there seems to be a trend toward arguing transformative use. Um, and this is, uh, again, something we can discuss at greater length if, uh, if there's an interest at the end of the conversation. So in case law, the Supreme Court has emphasized that the purpose and character um, of the use of the copyrighted material is a primary indicator of fair use. Again, um, this, is, uh, this has become a much more important um, one of the factors in the last uh, few years of case law. The question really boils down to whether the use of the copyrighted material, and let's assume it's a verbatim copy or um, uh, that, that's been reproduced, uh, and whether it's transformed to such an extent as to result in a new work worthy of separate protection. So in order to determine the answer, a couple of questions generally are considered. Things like, has the new content or expression been, at, has there been new content or expression added to the original work? Uh, has this new content added to or changed the meaning of the original work? Uh, does the new content represent additional value added, resulting in something that contains new information, deeper or new understandings, or a new aesthetic perspective? So really digging into what does transformative mean and does this new work indeed transform that original underlying work? Okay, ultimately, now the, the challenge here is that ultimately the decision is um, the court's decision to make, and um, there are some questions around whether it makes sense to have judges who may or may not be particularly knowledgeable about the art world or um, intellectual property law uh, make these creative determinations. Um, and this is also where we see the nexus of the way that artists think and the way that lawyers think really um, coming together in a way that's maybe not so productive sometimes. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how this ultimately plays out in the courts. Uh, I'm hoping that at some point this will be the impetus to create some change in the uh, copyright law itself. All right, and the final fair use uh, factor is market effect. And again, this is the one that, that is often thrown out um, as the reason for um, there not being uh, an infraction, and in fact, you know, it's fair use because I'm not infringing on your market at all. Again, it is one element to be considered. Um, so in other words, does the use of the pre-existing work deprive the underlying copyright owner of income or sales or have a negative impact on the potential uh, market for that pre-existing work? Um, in a lot of these cases, uh, there is certainly a lot of money at stake, 
And so the market, the market effect is going to be something that's going to be um, more important when you've got more money at stake, of course. Okay, so the third leg of our um, three-legged law stool before we get into the, uh, the cases today. It's the Visual Artist Rights Act, otherwise known as VARA. So since we're here today to talk about visual art and its integration in constructed environments, we must consider two really important additions to the copyright law, which were passed in 1990. Number one, Congress finally recognized that architecture is an art form that performs a very public and societal purpose, and so thus deserved protection under the Copyright Act. So Congress passed the Architectural Works Copyright Protection Act in 1990, which amended the Copyright Act to specifically include protection for architectural work. So for the first time, architects were able to go ahead and register um, for protection of their work. Um, the second important change in 1990 was this Visual Artist Rights Act, um, which goes to codify uh, some protection for what we consider um, to be moral rights. So why did Congress add VARA? Two main reasons. Uh, number one is that it was a requirement to provide some protection um, of moral rights within the United States that would be on par with European law in order for the United States to enter the Berne Convention, which is an international copyright treaty that allows for the recognition of copyrights uh, amongst the signatories. So meaning that um, there's no international way to protect your copyright, but if you are a member of the Berne Convention, other countries will recognize United States copyrights just as we have to recognize copyrights from other signatory countries. The second reason um, was at least in part a response to what happened with Richard Serra's Tilted Arc. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this artwork, um, but I'll just briefly run through the scenario. In 1981, um, artist Richard Serra was commissioned by the Arts and Architecture Program, which is a, was a federal arts program, to install a sculpture, um, Tilted Arc, in Federal Plaza in New York City. Tilted Arc was a curved raw, a wall of raw steel, so you can imagine how attractive that was for people who were not really into contemporary art. Uh, it was 120 feet long and 12 feet high, and it bisected Federal Plaza, which is a large area in the midst of several buildings. The sculpture cost about $175,000, which was a pretty decent sized commission at that point. Those working in the surrounding buildings had to walk around the sculpture now instead of being able to go across the plaza. And so for a lot of people working in those buildings, it became an impediment to using that open space, which they had previously enjoyed without having something in their way. Um, for Sarah, that was the point. He, um, he said that the viewer becomes aware of himself and his movements through the plaza. As he moves, the sculpture changes. Um, contraction and expansion of the sculpture results from the viewer's movements. Step by step, the perception not only of the sculpture, but of the entire environment changes. So something that we can all um, maybe think about and, and find interesting intellectually, but how, it, how that impacts people's daily lives, of course, is a different story. So not surprisingly, there was some conflict um, over the installation of this work. People objected to it. Uh, and the federal office that commissioned the piece held a meeting to discuss whether it should be removed from the plaza um, and relocated. Not surprisingly, the artist objected to this plan, stating that the sculpture was site-specific, meaning that it really could only exist in that location and that's how he designed it, um, and that the relocation of the work would result in its destruction. He asserted that if the work were to be moved, he would take his name off of it. So again, you know, we have this dichotomy. The art community hailed the project as a very important work of art, but members of the public found it to be an eyesore, something that a lot of people working in the public sector have certainly come up against with artworks in their community. So what to do? So they held a public hearing uh, where a lot of people spoke in favor and against the piece, and ultimately uh, the committee voted four to one to remove the work. Uh, the court, uh, when Sarah appealed this, the court said that he really had no right to um, have a hearing before the decision to remove the work, the work belonged to the government, and so they could do whatever they wanted. So under the cover of night, March 15, 1989, the tilted arc was cut into three pieces and taken to a scrapyard in Brooklyn uh, and left behind end of our sort of a sad end to um, an interesting piece. 
However, the fact that it was gone did not mean that it no longer remained in terms of the context of the conversation around art in public spaces. Um, the tilted art controversy marked a very important moment in public art history that not only contributed to the adoption of the Visual Artist Rights Act the next year, but also ushered in changes in terms of the way that artists viewed their work. While many artists continue to, and still do to this day, approach their work as an intervention within a public space, there is definitely more of a tendency to use materials that convey less heaviness and permanence um, and to encourage some communication between uh, the artist and the public. Uh, that, as we've seen, has, has evolved into a much more uh, public-oriented practice for a lot of artists, as well as uh, the collaborations that happen with architects and designers. Unfortunately, the, the situation also became a whipping boy for those who wanted to criticize the government's expenditure of public money on artwork, uh, and that helped fuel now uh, the constant need that we have to justify spending on public art with data showing the hard economic benefits to these investments. But um, of course, that is a conversation for another time and an entirely separate webinar. Okay, so um, VAR applies to works of visual art uh, as defined in the copyright law. And this is the page out of the copyright law that defines visual art. And so you can see it is somewhat limited um, in that it, it does focus on paintings, drawings, prints, or sculptures existing in a single copy or limited editions of 200 copies or fewer. That's, um, that's definitely sometimes important to differentiate uh, those unique works of, of art or limited works of art that are uh, considered to be more in the fine art category than in the mass produced category. And what does VARA protect? VARA protects attribution and integrity. Uh, these are two really important points that uh, definitely have bolstered the position of artists in the United States. Um, it does not go as far as those traditional moral rights laws in Europe, which definitely uh, give artists even more rights, but it's, it started, sort of starts to move us in that direction. So attribution uh, would be thought of as the right to claim authorship for an artist. So if it's uh, a piece that, that an artist has created, they have the right to have their name on it. Um, they also have the right to prevent the use of their name as uh, the author of a work of visual art or in the event of a distortion, mutilation, or other modifications of the work which would be prejudicial to the artist's honor or reputation. Um, just as a side note, this is an actual document that my daughter created in an attempt to avoid showing me that she had not received positive marks for her first week of kindergarten. Luckily, I did not have to rely on VARA to convince the teacher that this work should not be attributed to me. It was rather obvious. The second thing that's- That's really funny. <laughs> Thank you for adding that. I thought it was very cute. I couldn't believe that she had actually written mommy on the line instead of my name, but that's all right. Um, anyway, uh, the second, uh, the second uh, prong of VARA, the, the protection that it offers is with regard to the integrity of a work. So this means that um, there's a protection against the destruction of any work of recognized stature and the work of recognized stature, part of that um, uh, law is important again, as we take a look at some of these uh, lawsuits that have come up. So, sorry, I'm getting a little thirsty here. Um, so, this, so this part of our prevents the destruction of work of recognized stature and any intentional or grossly negligent destruction of the work. Um, this actually was a key element of the five points case, which we're going to get to shortly. The only exception to these rights is that the modification of the artwork due to the passage of time or the inherent nature of the work does not qualify as mutilation or modification that would be protected by VARA. This is an, also an important distinction um, because modification that occurs as a result of conservation or presentation circumstances, such as lighting and placement, would be um, considered a modification due to the passage of time unless the damage is, a, is as a result of gross negligence. So this becomes an important distinction when you're talking about um, the owner of the, of the work and the property having the ability to relocate and move works or um, change things around the work such as the lighting. VARA rights are not transferable. So unlike the rights that you get under copyright, 
the Visual Artist Rights Act rights are specific to the artist and cannot be transferred. They can, however, be waived. And this, again, becomes an important aspect of doing business um, with artists and within that context of intellectual property rights. Many contracts will include waivers um, of the VARA rights. And I don't necessarily object to those waivers because I have some issues with the way that VARA is written um, in that it is often very unclear in terms of how it's to be applied. So I actually prefer to see waivers, uh, but I also want to see some replacement language that does protect the artist in a way that is uh, reasonably administrable by um, the owner of the work. All right. And uh, also as a, a distinction from regular copyrights or other copyright rights, um, VARA rights only last for the life of the author. So unlike copyright, which lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years, the VARA rights die with the author and so cannot be passed on to anybody else um, or inherited. Remedies for violating VARA uh, are, are the same as the remedies for um, violating other aspects of copyright, um, but mainly what we're gonna see are requests for money or um, injunction. So people look for damages um, or to stop whatever action they claim is violating their VARA rights. It is also important to note that um, VARA is a federal law, so it takes precedence over state laws. However, there are a number of states that offer separate protections um, for, uh, uh, for artists. And uh, as long as the federal law serves as the floor for those rights and the states are offering more rights, then those states' laws are fine. They can't uh, give fewer rights than the federal laws do. Um, but this is also where we see some conflict in California, where I'm practicing now. Uh, the uh, California Arts and Preservations Act differs just enough from VAR that there are some conflicts and sometimes some challenges in interpreting uh, what rights are going to apply. Okay, so let's take a look at some cases. We've now covered the three uh, legs of our law stool. And um, the first case we're gonna look at is Carter versus Helmsley Spear. So until the recent uptick in cases around the use of street art, there have been relatively few cases addressing our issues over the years. Um, this is probably due in large part to the limited resources that artists tend to have, but it's also probably because these issues have tended to be settled out of court, um, at least until the more recent trend of companies pushing back so hard and so publicly by preemptively filing lawsuits against the artists. Um, this has generally been a dispute where the artists complain about the way in which their um, work is being treated, and then there is some sort of resolution. In any event, there are a couple of disputes um, that did go to court, and then we can learn a little bit about the application of VARA by the courts. And one of the first cases was this case, the Carter versus Helmsley Spears. So this is the artwork um, that was installed in a building, um, and in December of 1991, the artist team uh, that, that constructed this had been hired by the building owner to design, create, and install sculpture and other permanent installations in the, the lobby and um, other spaces um, appurtenant. The owners, determined that the, the owners determined the location of the artwork, but the artists were the ones who had full authority to design, color, and style the artwork that they installed. Here's another shot of it. Um, and in 1994, the building was sold. Helmsley Spear assumed the management of the property and told the artists that they were going to remove the art from the building. The artists believed um, that this was a mutilation of their artwork under VARA and so filed a lawsuit. This is just a couple years into the law actually being there, so there really hadn't been any other tests of it. Um, and so they filed a lawsuit to stop uh, Helmsley Spear from taking the action of removing the work. Um, and Helmsley Spear took the position that the work belonged to them under a work for hire theory. Um, so back to that question of uh, who owns the copyright uh, based on who, uh, whether this was a work for hire or something independently uh, that, that was owned and that the ownership for which remains with the artist. So while this case was ultimately determined against the artist based on the court's analysis that the artist's work was indeed a work for hire, so VARA did not apply, um, what it did establish is that the relationship of the commissioning body to the artist 
should be a primary focus in all commissions. Uh, thus, what we've seen is um, an increase in articulation and explanation as to what that relationship is. Is it an employment relationship or is it an independent contracting relationship? And if the artist wishes to retain uh, moral rights, it's imperative that the expectations for that copyright ownership and ongoing obligations to the artwork be clearly detailed in the contract. All right. In our next case, uh, Phillips versus Pembroke Real Estate, the artist David Phillips brought a, a VARA claim against Pembroke Real Estate, this was in 2006, in a dispute over a display of 27 of his sculptures in a park in Boston. Um, there was a planned redesign of the park and that plan called for the removal and relocation of the sculptures. Very unhappy with this plan, uh, the artist sought an injunction under VARA claiming that the removal of his works would violate his rights of integrity. The court determined that VARA uh, does not uh, apply if the modification is a result of the uh, public presentation, including the light and lighting and placement of the work. And that was something that I referred to earlier uh, in terms of what is not covered by VARA. The law states that these modifications are not a distortion or mutilation of the work and therefore do not entitle the artist to make a claim. And the lower court held that Phillips works were together a single site specific work integrated into the park and subject to the public presentation exception to VARA, this, this exception. Um, and therefore, VARA did not apply and the park administrators were allowed to remove or modify the work. What's interesting here is that um, on appeal, the court actually um, upheld the, the lower court's decision, but um, on a slightly different um, uh, basis. And they put out a statement that, that's somewhat problematic and uh, we'll see where this goes. Because on appeal, um, they, they, like I said, they upheld on, on uh, alternative grounds, but they said that by definition, site-specific art integrates its location as one of its elements. Therefore, they didn't like the reading of the law to say that on the one hand, you could talk about removing site-specific work from its location, um, as being an exception because that necessarily destroys the work of art. They went on to say that by concluding that VARA applies to site-specific work and then allowing the removal, the district court purports to protect site-specific work in a way that VARA does not intend. Um, and that this didn't make sense to them in terms of a way of reading uh, the, the plain language of VARA. So either they concluded either VARA recognizes site-specific work and protects it, or it doesn't recognize site-specific work at all. And they concluded that in their view, the plain language of VARA does not protect site-specific art. This is really important and obviously very problematic for most art that's created for public spaces. Um, so I'm sure that we'll be seeing some more pushback on um, these conclusions. And we, we've already seen uh, that to some degree uh, in another important case, Kelly versus the Chicago Park District. So in this case, in 1984, Chapman Kelly, who's a painter, asked for and received permission to install a display of uh, wildflowers in the park. And this is in, uh, again, in Grant Park in Chicago. This is obviously not a picture of the piece itself, but a picture of Grant Park. Um, the garden was designed to be enjoyed immediately and then also on an ongoing basis as the plants grew and changed. Over time, the wildflower installation indeed changed, and by 2004, the Chicago Park District decided to modify it by changing the shape of the garden and cutting back substantially on the entire size of the garden. The artist was upset and sued, um, asked for $25 million in damages under VARA, contending that the Park District had violated his integrity rights under VARA when it cut uh, the size and, and shape of the garden. Ultimately, the case was decided against the artist on grounds um, not having to do with whether VARA covers site-specific work. So there's that, but um, uh, because the, the, the court found that the garden didn't qualify for copyright protection in the first place as it was not ultimately fixed in a tangible medium. So back to that original concept of copyrighted works needing to be fixed in a tangible medium. Um, they uh, determined that a garden does not rise to that level. This is an important uh, consideration for landscape architecture and um, looking at those uh, collaborations and combinations of landscape design along with um, artistic input. But again, um, question for 
another conversation. What's important to note here is that the, the Kelly Court took a slightly less strict position on the protectability of site-specific art, stating that there are a couple of reasons to doubt the Pembroke Court's position, the, the previous uh, case that we just talked about, um, that VARA simply doesn't cover site-specific art at all. First, the term site-specific art appears nowhere in the statute, so nothing in the definition of the work of visual art, either explicitly or by implication, excludes site-specific work from moral rights protection. The second point that they made is that Phillips' all or nothing approach to site-specific art might be unwarranted. Site-specific art is not necessarily destroyed if moved, modified, but not necessarily utterly destroyed. So they left the door open to there being um, a more liberal uh, construction read from uh, the VARA language. Finally, uh, the Kelly Court found that the, the portion of VARA that addresses a building exception on its face covers a particular kind of site-specific art. And this comes up um, in a number of the uh, mural cases as well. The building exception applies to works incorporated in or made part of a building in such a way that removing the work from the building will cause the destruction, distortion, mutilation, or other modification of the work. So that's the, the long law explanation. Um, and it states that if the artist consents to the integration and acknowledges in writing that removal will likely destroy the work, then the work will not receive VARA protection. So this is essentially akin to a waiver where the artist says, okay, I know that you're going to integrate my work into the construction. And I also acknowledge that by removing it, it's going to destroy the work. Um, and by, by making those acknowledgements, the artist and the artist's work will not receive that VARA protection. Uh, thus, its presence in the statute, so this is the argument of the court, the presence of, in the statute suggests that site-specific art is not categorically excluded from VARA, but in fact is something that was given um, consideration. So while these observations were not all dispositive and in fact didn't help Kelly in his pursuit of protection under VARA for his work, um, it does again indicate that willingness to perhaps be flexible about the applicability of VARA to site-specific work. While there have been several other cases along the way, one of the most notable cases uh, that's often cited is the Kent Twitchell uh, matter, where he won the largest settlement uh, ever under VARA and CAPA, the California law, in 2008 for $1.1 million against the government and uh, the US government and 12 other defendants after his mural of Ed Roche was painted over um, two years earlier without his knowledge or consent. Okay, um, let's see if I can get this to move, oops, okay. Um, while there have been several other cases along the way, one of the, um, uh, we, we see the impact of the Twitchell case uh, in this case, which was brought by a Miami artist. Uh, and, and, and this case was brought because in a wide ranging ad campaign, American Eagle Outfitters, used a mural created by one of Miami's most well-known street artists with the awesome name of A-Hole Sniffs Glue. Um, and as part of the campaign, American Eagle showed a model with a spray paint can, making it look like it was the model who created the mural. And they even hired artists in Medellin, Colombia to recreate one of the murals for a store opening there. So they took that mural and recreated it in several offensive different ways um, to the artist. And of course, the artist uh, was unhappy with this. And in addition to the infringement claims that he brought, he also claimed that this sort of misappropriation of, of his art damaged his reputation. So this is another wrinkle that we start to see emerging at this point, which is that street artists, you know, radical street artists, don't necessarily want their work to be seen in a commercial context the way that um, it was seen here and in the way in which uh, many fashion and other companies are um, appropriating street art for their purposes. So despite the fact that uh, there was a $3 million settlement in this case, uh, it doesn't really seem like many companies have been deterred. And this brings us to the biggest case that is currently driving an increased interest in the role of street art and the pr uh, protectability of murals. And this is the five points case. 
Um, in this case, a group of artists were awarded $6.7 million for the destruction of their work at the Five Point site in Queens, New York. This came as somewhat of a surprise in that um, everybody assumes that property rights are king and that uh, the artists are always going to lose. But in this case, um, the, the court agreed to, um, uh, and the court and the parties agreed to have the jury determine the outcome and that that jury uh, decision was going to go to the judge as an advice, basically advice to the judge, and then the judge would render a final opinion. So when the jury came out with this gigantic award for the artists, many of us thought, well, there's no way the judge is going to uphold that. The judge is going to say, that's nice, sorry, artists, but property rights win. However, um, that is not what happened. So let's run through this a little bit. Uh, since 1993, a developer, uh, Jerry Walkoff collaborated with artists to put murals on a complex of buildings he owned in a neighborhood in Queens near MoMA, uh, MoMA's PS1. Um, so of course, we all know what happens when arts come into a community. Over the course of the 20 years that the artists were there, created um, thousands of murals on the walls. The complex became well known, uh, became a tourist destination that attracted visitors and uh, definitely was one of the contributing factors to the transformation of the neighborhood into a much more attractive location for development. In 2013, uh, as the owner and developer prepared to develop the site, the artists expressed their dissatisfaction with the development plans and tried to intervene. Now, this is where I think uh, property owners most get uh, concerned and nervous. It's like, well, it's my property. I should be able to do whatever I want with it. And in this case, you have a developer who for many years was incredibly supportive of the artists and allowed this incredible um, site to be used uh, by artists to do their murals. Unfortunately, um, rather than uh, work this through and uh, adhere to the terms of VARA and uh, comply with the, the policies that it requires, the processes it requires, uh, the developer whitewashed all of the artwork on the buildings and let the buildings sit for several months before demolishing them in 2014. The developer contended that the artists knew for many years that the ultimate plan was to destroy the buildings and redevelop the property. Nevertheless, um, the, uh, the attorney for the artists claimed that the developer's failure to give the statutory 90 days notice meant that his actions in whitewashing and demolishing the work were a VARA violation. So under the VARA rules, there are um, uh, there, there is a process laid out that must be followed in, in order to remove a work of art. And that's fine. Um, and, and again, in California, we have uh, similar requirements that are slightly different, um, but there are safeguards in place so that property owners are not held hostage. Um, but in this case, the developer did not follow those rules. Um, and so more than 20 artists banded together and filed a suit against him. After both parties' um, uh, failure to have the case decided at some summary judgment, the case went forward to trial. And as I mentioned before, in a surprise verdict, the jury found in favor of the artists. Uh, because the work was sanctioned, so allowed by the developer, there wasn't the standard hurdle of establishing worth in spite of the unauthorized nature of a lot of street art. But instead, the case focused on the important question around the transitory nature of graffiti art uh, because these murals were painted over and over again uh, as determined by the artists who were um, leading the, the project there. Um, as, and as well, the definition of recognized stature became a key point in the litigation um, and, and thus the calculation of damages suffered by the artists. Um, given the way in which it was this, that there was the scale of the site and the often excellent quality of the works as a group that served to elevate the reputation of the site, it's a little interesting that the jury found that the individual works each qualified as works of recognized stature rather than the whole site being the work of recognized stature. And I think that's a, a, an interesting point of discussion when taking a look at this case. Uh, even more surprising was the fact that the jury's verdict was upheld by the judge uh, several months later. In February of 2018, the judge issued an opinion finding that the developer was in fact liable and the artists were entitled to receive their damages of more than six and a half million dollars. A particular note here in the opinion, and I would encourage people, I know this sounds like a legal nerd thing to say, but honestly, the opinion that this judge wrote is really a lot of fun to read. Um, it, it, it's a pretty quick read, and what's particularly interesting about it 
is that the judge went to great lengths to describe the disrespectful and inconsiderate attitude of the developers throughout the proceedings. This is, um, the reason that this is so interesting is that it clearly shows that, you know, there are all these legal things that people have to pay attention to, but ultimately the way in which people conduct themselves um, can have a tremendous bearing on the outcome of the case. So there is this unspoken additional element that gets considered and that's the jerk factor. This case also pushes the envelope a little further in terms of what types of art uh, courts are willing to protect under VARA, which is, in my view, great, and uh, almost certainly signaling a willingness to depart from the previous more conservative approaches that we uh, learned about in Kelly and Pembroke. Five Points does represent a very public resolution of a dispute over the treatment of street art that came out in favor of the artist, but because its focus really is on issues of recognized stature and the, defend, uh, the behavior of the defendant, um, it is not necessarily the gigantic sledgehammer that people are portraying it as. Uh, it has kind of become the poster child for artists' rights in public space, both um, emboldening artists and sending some chilling waves or, or fear of chilling waves through the developer community, but I, I'm not convinced that this is the way that it should be read. Um, the fear is, of course, that it could greatly reduce developers' willingness to work with artists on their projects because they would be afraid of getting sued. Uh, and this is why it's really important to emphasize that the developer wouldn't have necessarily had these same problems if he had simply followed the process laid out in VARA for noticing his intention to remove the work and allowing the artist 90 days to either remove the work or waive their rights. So, while it may have inspired artists to be more proactive about protecting uh, their VARA rights, Five Points does not actually address the same concerns that are being raised by a slew of other conflicts that have been the, in the news lately um, since that case. Most of these new cases are looking at the issue of whether murals placed on architectural works are separable from the buildings themselves. Um, and if they are, they merit copyright protection. If not, then they fall under the pictorial representation exemption in copyright law, which we will talk about in a moment. Okay. So I think that some of the nervousness around um, the decision in the five points case is maybe what prompted H&M to preempt an artist's lawsuit in this case by filing one of their own. In 2017, H&M created an ad campaign. This is a picture from that ad campaign using artist um, revokes mural as a backdrop. Um, the mural was, was the primary fo focus of the campaign, as you can see here. Uh, this is one of the advertisements, I believe, for men's shorts. And in this case, the artist did not file a lawsuit because H&M preempted him with the filing of their own lawsuit for declaratory judgment. So what they did was um, knowing that the artist was making noise about having uh, their work inappropriately used in the ad campaign, rather than wait for the artist to file an infringement lawsuit, they turned around and filed a lawsuit asking the court to declare that they were not in violation of the artist's rights. This was viewed as a pretty incredible attack on the artist and got a lot of bad publicity for H&M. Um, I, I believe that that's probably why ultimately the case was dropped. Um, so there was no ruling in this case, um, and, and it definitely remains a, a bit of a gray issue uh, because in this case, uh, this graffiti was unsanctioned art. It was not um, commissioned or um, sanctioned by any government or owner. Uh, and so the question that remains is whether artists have uh, a, a protectable copyright interest um, that could potentially usurp the rights of the property owner uh, when we have unsanctioned artwork here. And that's a, a question that's going to continue to be asked, uh, I imagine, in, in uh, coming conflicts and disputes. Okay, so the tactic, though, that, that H&M employed is something now that we're seeing other companies employ as well. Um, and we see this uh, being used, again, in this case where Mercedes peremptorily filed a lawsuit against a group of artists when they complained about Mercedes using their work in a commercial campaign. You can see here on the left, the work with the artist standing in front of it, and on the right, um, the Mercedes um, advertisement. Mercedes throws all the now expected claims out. They claim fair use on the murals, stating that they're exempt from copyright protection, 
and the murals are blurred, not seen in their entirety, viewed at an angle, and are not the central focus. So trying to hit those points um, in fair use that we talked about earlier in order to um, establish their ability to use this without uh, permission from the artist. This lawsuit actually builds on arguments made by GM um, when it defended a claim brought against it by an artist for their use of his mural, also located in Detroit. And um, this, in this case, the artist did uh, do the filing as opposed to the company. In this situation, GM used Adrian Falker or Smash 137's mural painted on a Detroit parking garage in 2014 in their publicity for Cadillac. While this mural was commissioned, and so the unclean um, hands argument of, of, the, of the work being um, unsanctioned wouldn't work, GM tries to muddy the waters by claiming that the mural is not separate from the building and therefore not susceptible to copyright protection. GM claims that because the artist's mural is painted onto an architectural work, it falls squarely within the pictorial representation exemption and his copyright infringement claim should be dismissed. Uh, they rely on, a, on another case, which um, we did not cover today, but uh, it was a case maybe some of you heard of where uh, an artist uh, objected to the use of his work in the Batman movie. Um, the artist sued Warner Brothers for infringement when in the movie, a scene featured a courtyard where the artist's sculpture was installed. And in that case, the court determined that the sculpture was so integral to the architecture as to be inseparable and thus subject to the pictorial represent pictorial representation exemption under copyright law. You have to make all of these mouthfuls to say. So this part of the copyright law is interesting because while now architecture is in fact protectable under copyright law, um, there is an exemption which protects uh, the uh, creation of pictorial works based on architecture. So this part of the law limits the protection for architectural works by stating that the copyright in an architectural work that has been constructed, as opposed to just the plans, um, does not include the right to prevent the making, distributing, or public display of pictures, paintings, photographs, or other pictorial representations of the work if the building in which the work is embodied is located in or ordinarily visible from a public place. Um, so again, very important distinction. And of course, this is what comes up all the time. Well, the work is, you know, it's in the public view. Um, if it's in the public view, don't I have the right to use it any way I want? Well, no, there is, you know, there's this in between and there are some competing um, aspects of copyright law. And um, so we have to take a look at the way in which the artwork is in fact, or not integrated with the architecture. Uh, in the definition section of the copyright law, pictorial, graphic, or sculptural works are protectable only to the extent that they can be identified separately from and are capable of existing independently of the utilitarian aspects of uh, the article on which they're affixed. So this is where talking to um, conservators is uh, crucial because in my experience, almost any mural can be removed from the wall on which it is sitting. Um, so uh, you know, whether that, uh, to, as that technology improves for removing artwork from surfaces, um, how does that play into the language of the copyright law? And of course, what was the intention here uh, in terms of what removability and separability meant? So the court denied GM's attempt to get the case dismissed on these grounds, uh, which is interesting and great for those of us who'd like to have uh, some more court opinions to look at. So we'll have to wait and see what happens at trial, um, in fact, if it does go to trial. And in the meantime, it's important to also acknowledge the role of public opinion and the interface with local laws and policies. So um, we've got all the copyright stuff that we've talked about already, um, but there was a situation last week that came up, maybe some of you saw it in the news, uh, and this situation really highlights that interaction between federal copyright law local laws and the interaction between laws, government, and community. In this situation, there was a mural painted by uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat and his uh, former classmate and collaborator, Al Diaz, on a wall in um, Indianapolis. The mural was originally requested by the bar owner, um, but more than 30 years later, a few weeks ago, uh, someone called in an anonymous complaint asking for the graffiti to be removed. So, um, 
obviously somebody in the public who didn't recognize the SAMO uh, mark here and didn't know the history behind it and saw this as uh, purely graffiti work. So after inspecting the mural, the city did in fact order its removal, but luckily it became such a big story. Um, there was an outcry and a decision was made to reverse uh, the decision and the mural was allowed to remain. You know, again, in this case, we're not talking about unsanctioned graffiti. We're talking about a mural that was approved of by the building owner. Um, so this all raises interesting questions around public perception and the popularity of public art uh, and also highlights the need for communities to consider not only the copyright law, but the standards and opinions in the community and how or even whether that should play a role in how we bring art into our built environments. And so with that, I'm going to wrap it up and turn it back over to our hosts and see if we've got some questions here. Yeah, we sure do. Wow, there's a lot of gray area in a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, lots of <laughs> oh, boy. Lawyers, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, first question, how, how do volunteers work? Do they, retain ownership of their art if they're doing it on behalf of a public entity? Um, so that is an interesting question. And, and this is going to go to my uh, pat response that you need to have contracts. Uh, so I think it's very important for people to understand that whenever there's effort that's put out to create creative expression, there's something of value there. So whether somebody is employed or volunteers, that needs to be taken seriously. And uh, sorry about that. I guess I should have turned off my phone. Um, whether or not somebody has volunteered um, shouldn't necessarily be the important aspect uh, of consider for consideration. The really important thing is: Do you have a creative work that's been um, that's been made here, and what are the intentions around it? Who who wants to have that uh, ownership going forward, and how is it going to be handled? Um, if somebody has not been paid for their work, of course, it raises some questions as to why they're not being paid for their work. Um, and at the very least, that perhaps they can hold on to the copyright as uh, uh, one of the ways in which their, their contribution is recognized. Um, in general, though, I do not think that uh, most of the time the commissioning party should hold the copyright because on the one hand, that ends up being kind of a shorthand or um, shortcut way of ensuring that there's never any issue that comes up around the ownership or future uses of the work. Um, and it, it can cut off that liability. But it also places a, a, a set of requirements on that owner. They, they're now in the position to um, need to defend that copyright if it's infringed. They need to maintain it. They need to you know, oversee it in um, ways that they wouldn't necessarily have to if that ownership remains with the artist. The other important thing to consider is that um, uh, many artists who are working in the public realm have a particular style and way of working. And so if they uh, turn over their copyright, and, and perhaps this is even more relevant if you're a volunteer, you're an artist volunteering and you're um, creating a work for, uh, for somebody and they want to hold the copyright to that, the fact that this commissioning party holds the copyright to that artist's work could mean that they could technically preclude the artist from doing work in the future if they felt, in their opinion, that that future work was too similar to the work that the artist had done for them. So that raises um, some additional concerns in terms of ensuring that artists are um, able to maintain sustainable and viable careers in the public art realm. Great, thank you. Um, using five points, since architectural work can be copyrighted, can an architect argue that buildings that they design that are copyrighted cannot be destroyed? No, there are exceptions for that as well. So, um, you know, that gets that does get into um, more of the land use and preservation um, side of things. And so the way in which uh, a work of architecture is treated down the road is gonna depend on much more than just the copyright law. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Um, can you provide, uh, there's a lot of questions about this, the five points. Um, 
the the judge's opinion how can someone read that where can they go to to get more information i can certainly provide that link and maybe you guys can put it up on the website okay um but it i'm sure if you just google five points decision um it, it's pretty readily available online um, but i can certainly send you the link after this and you can put it up on the on the website okay hey, yeah happy to do so uh, next one. Can you explain more about when it would be legal for us to use photos of works of art in public places? Uh -huh. I often use photos that I personally have taken. That is a good question because I'm pretty sure we all do that. <laughs> right. Well, and this is, of course, an issue that's coming up a lot um, with regard to the use of photos in social media contexts. And, you know, does it matter whether you're an influencer or not? And you know, how does that play into things? And this, again, is really where we're seeing a lot of these laws that have been kind of amended and twisted and, and they're trying to fit into modern times and maybe they're not fitting into modern times well enough. So I would like to see there be some more conversation around these issues to um, really step back and see like, do we need to really reevaluate the way that we're treating intellectual property and the way that we're treating images um, as uh, as content and as objects of value within uh, the context of our, our current world. Um, so you can take photos. There's, the, as I mentioned, there's the pictorial exception. Um, but you do want to be a little bit careful about representing um, works of art um, separately from the, the architectural aspects. Um, the best the, the best um, practice, of course, is always to get permission from the artist if you're doing it in a context that you know is going to be seen by a lot of people, or if there is any commercial aspect to that use of the photo. But generally speaking, I mean, if you're using a photo, uh, whether it's of a streetscape or of a specific artwork for personal use, uh, you're not going to have a problem. The other thing is that you know, if, if somebody decides to be particularly litigious, um, you can just take it down, um, you know, if, if they're objecting to your use of, uh, of their work in some way that you did not feel was uh, offensive. But um, this is where we get back to my typical lawyer answer to general questions, which is it depends. All right. Thank you. Um, this is an opinion question, I guess. At what point do you think graffiti will be protected? And we're re referring, I believe, if I'm reading the question correctly, to graffiti that is not solicited. Um, so really true graffiti. Um, will there ever be a time when it will just be embraced and not promptly removed? Um, sadly, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know if that will ever happen. Um, I also think that um, that it probably won't ever happen that we fully embrace graffiti. I mean, graffiti in, in the unsanctioned sense um, ranges, obviously. You've got everything from gang tags to uh, beautiful murals that, that are painted without permission. So there does need to be some distinction um, in the intention behind the work that's going up. Uh, but I do think it's really important for us to start addressing these concerns now because we have a lot of crossover um, in terms of commercial speech that's happening. Um, you know, there are different signage laws and um, policies that apply to the use of um, images in a commercial sense in, in public spaces. And you know, some would argue that a lot of that stuff junks up the environment more than the graffiti does. So we've got some aesthetic judgments that are very difficult to codify or uh, come up with an objective way in which to deal with them. And that's where this uh, interaction with the public becomes important. Um, and, and I think that it becomes even more crucial to start addressing these topics because we're now looking at uh, the, the new site of um, virtual work. So you've got uh, VR and AR coming into play and dealing with the same kinds of challenges of commercialization and advertisement. Um, you know, taking advantage of these new uh, platforms, as well as artistic interventions, as well as potentially um, graffiti or, you know, unsanctioned inappropriate interventions. So um, I would say that 
I don't think that we're going to see a point at which everything that is visual and, and aesthetic or not within our community is embraced, but I do think we're going to have to get a little bit more um, articulate about how we treat things and um, take some stands on the aesthetic value of things. Thank you. And I related to that. Um, someone has typed in that there was a painting, uh, a mural, I guess in quotes, that was never authorized or approved by the city, um, but that was uh, just removed um, because of a neighbor complaint. So the artists that never received approval, do they have any rights to it, uh, either way of its removal or not? Right. Well, that's that's exactly the gray area that I pointed to before. Um, there, there is definitely um, some unclarity around the rights that artists who've created unsanctioned work, um, what, what are the rights that they have, especially when that work has maybe garnered some community attention and has become a work of recognized stature under the law. Um, you know, so trying to balance property rights of the owner of the property versus the intellectual property rights of the artist, that is definitely a gray area that needs more exp uh, exploration. Thank you. This is a good question. Are there any nuances regarding advertising artwork, such as like a, a Coca-Cola mural painted on a historic building? Yes. Um, and this is going to rely in large part on local uh, policies and procedures that are in place for advertising and for murals. Um, I encourage communities to really pay close attention to um, whether they have mural ordinances or not and how they view uh, the, the, quote, artistic interventions um, from, from commercial standpoints. Um, in some cases even, I know, for instance, um, Shepard Berry has had some issues with his murals that most people view as art, um, but he signs them with his, uh, not with his name, but with Obey, which is a trademark. And if you look up Obey online, you get to a website that sells products. And so under some rules, that ends up being commercial speech as opposed to art. Um, so sanctioned or not, um, that, you know, depending on how it was approved, if it was approved as a mural, it might be violating the mural policies uh, because it's actually in effect commercial speech. Um, and so we have to not just look at one aspect of the law when we're interpreting uh, these questions, but to, to look across the board and understand the interaction uh, between or among um, those uh, community rules around murals and, and commercial speech, as well as the uh, art related laws. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, okay, I, I keep getting this question. Are art pieces subject to local zoning codes? Are art pieces subject to local zoning codes? Well, it, I'm going to I'm going to go back to my answer. It depends. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> normally speaking, zoning isn't necessarily going to impact um, art. There are going to be other aspects of of local laws that are um, that are going to be more relevant, but it may it may impact whether um, back to that question of commercial versus artistic. Um, you know, depending on what the zoning is for a building will determine what kinds of murals can be put on the outside or other, other artwork. And um, one of the folks that was kind of asking this question followed up with specifically wondering about setbacks. So I guess specifically I would say for safety reasons or for, uh, you know, view obstruction Right. Well, like that. you know, this is something that comes up, um, especially when we're talking about video billboards. And I know uh, here in West Hollywood, um, there's a really excellent program that curates uh, art onto those video billboards. So they're used a certain number of minutes every hour for commercial purposes and then a certain number of minutes every hour for um, public art. And, um, you know, those video billboards, I certainly find them distracting, but um, although an excellent uh, place to view some video art that otherwise wouldn't be viewed. Um, so yes, I mean, there has to be attention paid to the, the impact of particular artworks and 
I hate to keep going back to it depends, but you do have to look at local zoning ordinances um, along with everything else. And you do have to be concerned about the impact of the artwork on um, the, the safety or other liability issues um, in that public space. Now, you know, we can't always anticipate what's going to come up when we come up with a plan. So there may be a really well thought out, well documented, properly commissioned artwork that goes into place. And all of a sudden it's realized, oh, we didn't think about the fact that you can see it from here or there and it's really creating a problem. So in those scenarios, um, the, the way that the, the policies and procedures work, as well as the way that um, those projects have been documented and the way that that the obligations and responsibilities have been communicated to the artist are all they all come together as being very important in terms of figuring out a solution that is mutually acceptable to everybody in order to um, address any unintended consequences of the installation of artwork. Thank you. Um, next question. What about uh, artwork or specifically um, statues that uh, might have some controversy? So for example, um, a year or two ago, there was the, uh, the talk about the Confederate, sta Confederate statues in some Southern cities that were removed because of controversy. How does that work? Well, that is truly an entirely separate webinar. <laughs> Um, well, it looks like we have another webinar then. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> um, and it, it was not just in Southern cities, I will point out. Um, that is a, a very, very interesting um, topic of conversation and it has definitely become a flashpoint for uh, a lot of conflict in, in various communities. And, you know, I think that um, it is important to, to look at the intentions behind a lot of those works um that we're not talking about so whether those um statues are considered sculpture is kind of important right are these actually artworks or are they tools for um creating uh, discomfort for people within the community um are they tools for um uh, pushing a certain political perspective uh, because if you look at when those uh, statues were made um, many of them were made around um, at the same time as uh, civil rights was gaining traction or, uh, for instance, after Obama was elected president. You would not believe how many of these uh, Confederate monuments went up after Obama. So we're talking not about 200 years ago. We're talking about current times. So, um, you know, we can talk about the aesthetic value or lack thereof for, for many of those pieces, but I think it's really, it is really important to look at the intention behind those works and who commissioned them and why they were commissioned. And it does open up a, a larger conversation around what do we put into our communities? Again, like I could go on for hours about this because we um, are seeing a trend toward temporary work. And I think that that's in part in response to um, the frustration and, and challenge that communities face over addressing issues of artwork that's been installed in communities years ago that now becomes controversial because of changes in the way we think and more awareness that's out there now. Um, and so, all right, well, rather than putting permanent objects in place, let's make it temporary so that we can accommodate many voices and we don't have the issue of um, uh, permanent works that down the road cause problems. On the other hand, that needs to definitely be balanced with the idea that um, our built environment and the, the public art that we uh, install goes to create our communities. And, and that goes to um, uh, our identity and um, the, the, the continuity between generations. And so there's something very important and valuable about longstanding objects within our public spaces. So trying to balance um, all of those different uh, considerations can be a, a real challenge. And I'll stop there before I go on for another day or two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, let me see if I can find one that might not take too, too long since we only have a few moments left. Um, can, oh, this is interesting. Can components of a garden be protected even if the garden itself cannot be protected? I'm gonna fall back to it depends. 
Okay. <laughs> um, those elements are. So if you're talking about a sculpture within a garden, you're going to you know, have a, a, a clearer situation where that element can be protected. Um, but it really is going to depend on what you're talking about. So um, objects that are traditionally considered artwork um, that are integrated into a garden would be protectable. Um, gardens and landscape design, it's, it's definitely tough. And there has to be some real thought put into the way that uh, that work is articulated if it's going to, in fact, um, warrant uh, protection. So um, if you're relying on Mother Nature and the plants for that aspect of the garden, you're probably going to have less luck protecting it than if you're relying on the artist's intervention in terms of, say, the shape of the, of the land, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, last and final question. If uh, folks have further questions or they would uh, like to utilize your services, how should they reach out to you? Should they just Google or um, email? Well, what would you like? Um, I'm available many ways, uh, but the best way is probably to go to my website, which is artconverge.com, A-R-T-C-O-N-V-E-R-G-E.com. Um, and that's got all of my contact information and, and uh, a way to contact me. And you can also see the range of services that I offer there. Uh, otherwise, I imagine if they get in touch with you, they can probably find me that way as well. <laughs> My email is sarah at artconverge.com, and that's Sarah with an H at the end. Thank you, Sarah with an H at the end, <laughs> uh, for joining us today. I know, Leo, I think you're still on in the background. Margaret, I see you're still on in the background. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for working with us here at the Planning Webcast Consortium to talk about this very important topic. So I appreciate that. And for the Urban Design and Preservation Division of APA for hosting today's session. Uh, as a reminder, we are recording it and we'll have it up. And don't forget to log those credits. You'll get a 1.5 law credits. Uh, just head over to planning.org, log into your MyEPA account, and then you can search by the title or event number. Again, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And Sarah, hey, we'll see you back here shortly to talk about statues, right? <laughs> thanks, for, again, thanks for volunteering. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks.